Jody Arias. You may love to hate her, but you simply cannot ignore her. Nearly 10 years after her crime, Jody still has the ability to trigger strong reactions, making headlines, stirring up zealous loathing, creating fans, and inspiring lurid conspiracy theories. Jody has grabbed a hold of the public's passion and imagination. Why? Why is everyone so obsessed with Jody Arias? This is the last picture of Travis Alexander, taken mere seconds before he was shot and stabbed to death by Jody Arias. This photo, taken about two minutes later, shows Travis's bloodied body being dragged across the floor. It took approximately 136 seconds for Travis to go from this to this. Travis Alexander's death sent out shockwaves of destruction affecting Travis's family, Jody's family, the prosecution, and the man who spent over 10 months defending her in court. If Miss Arias is guilty of any crime at all, it is the crime of manslaughter and nothing more. If Jody Arias was perceived as evil, her court-appointed defense attorney, Kirk Nurmi, was thought to be defending a monster. Nurmi weathered both trials, defending his client to the best of his ability. The demands of the Arias trial were, were overwhelming. My job as an attorney was to save her life. Ultimately, Nurmi did keep Jody off of death row, but his efforts were not without consequences. In August of 2015, I noticed a swelling under my armpit. It was cancer. I definitely believe the stress of saving Miss Arias' life was the reason that, that cancer uh, came into mind. Death penalty cases are extremely stressful on the attorneys who are defending a capital defendant. It's not surprising to have a physical reaction to it. Nurmi successfully underwent chemotherapy, emerging a changed man. Throughout the five or six months that I was going through chemotherapy, I began to take a hard look at what I wanted to do and what I wanted to do with my life. It was during this period of reflection that Nurmi decided to write a book about his experience on the Arias trial. Trapped with Ms. Arias. I mean, he lets loose. He says that Jody drove him crazy when she would disagree with him. She'd lay down on the table and cry. She was flirtatious. She even discussed her vaginal grooming with him. It's not surprising that after the book's publication, Jody filed a complaint with the State Bar of Arizona against Nurmi because he violated attorney-client privilege. That's what she says. Nurmi decided it was not worth his time to fight for a career he no longer wanted. They wanted to suspend me for four years. Um, I sought disbarment. Gladly gave away my law license. Uh, without admitting to any wrongdoing. It would have been a fool's errand. I would have spent a lot of money and a lot of energy merely to maintain the law license that I had no desire to hang on to. It's been a year and I, there has not been a day when I wished that I had uh, not made the decision that I made. Currently, Nurmi coaches other lawyers who are having difficulties balancing the rigors of the job against their personal well-being. My job, uh, literally almost killed me. The American Bar Association says one in three lawyers either has a mental health problem or a drinking problem. I wanted to work to help lawyers that are struggling uh, with their own personal issues. But Jody's not done with Nurmi yet. On October 25th, 2017, Arias filed another lawsuit against Nurmi over his book. This time, seeking punitive damages in the form of an undisclosed sum of money. I'm not surprised that Miss Arias uh, made the choice to sue me because if it's one thing I am the world's leading expert on in this world, I believe uh, Jody Arias would be that thing. I stand by everything that is in the book as being true, and I look forward to uh, going into court and confronting each and every one of the allegations she made. So what inspired Jody's new lawsuit? 
respectfully ask the question for them, not me. You're asking me to speculate, and I can't speculate. But the internet does not lack people who are willing to speculate about Nermi, about Jody, and about the night of June 4th, 2008. One outrageous theory suggests Jody did not act alone. Matt was involved in the murder. He was there at the place when Jody was attacked. Just after her arraignment, Jody confidently declared that not only was she innocent, she would never be convicted. She said, God knows, Travis knows, I know, I'm innocent. It was during this period that Jody advanced the ninja theory, claiming that Travis Alexander died at the hands of two unidentified assailants. Of course, the ninja theory would eventually prove to be untrue. You're the one that did this, right? <laughs> yes. But what if she didn't do it alone? A small but vibrant community on the internet, Jody's Uber fans, have developed alternative theories about what might have actually happened that night. Some say it was a Mormon blood sacrifice. Others upped the ante and suggested it was a satanic ritual. Both of these outlandish scenarios assume multiple accomplices helped Jody kill Travis. And then there's the outer fringe of internet speculation, where Jody is actually Kourtney Kardashian. In all this noise, however, there is one person who has come forward who believes she has a legitimate alternative theory, Donovan Baring. I met Jody Arias in 2008 in the Phoenix County Jail. We became very, very good friends in the six months that I was there with her. The two cellmates forged enough of a bond that Jody trusted Donovan to run Jody's controversial Twitter account during her trial. I became and continued to be her friend, her right-hand man, as I was running her Twitter account. Donovan stood by Jody throughout both trials. But there came a time when Donovan, like so many other people, began to doubt Jody's credibility. She will manipulate people to do whatever she wants on her terms. And if you don't do what she wants, you don't want to ever cross Jody areas. However, one thing Donovan does not doubt is the story Jody told her about having an accomplice, Matt. Matt was involved in the murder only because he was there at the place when Jody was attacked by Travis. So here's the Matt theory. Donovan claims that on that fateful night, Jody was accompanied by a man named Matt. Matt heard an altercation upstairs. Donovan gives no last name. When he came upon the scene upstairs, Jody was on Travis's back. Jody was stabbing him in the back. Donovan says that Jody says that Matt was with her and can verify that Jody acted in self-defense. When Matt ran upstairs, he was assuming that Jody was being attacked by Travis. He thought he was protecting her from the beginning. However, Donovan has since been in contact with the mysterious Matt, who claims that Jody was the aggressor. He said she looked crazy, the look in her eyes, he had never seen it in her before. Donovan wants Matt's story out in the world. It was not how it was portrayed in any way by Jody Arias. And the truth needs to come out. She's where she needs to be today. She belongs in prison. And thank God nobody else's lives were taken. If anybody else would have been there, there may have been more than just Travis killed. It's unclear what the Matt theory, if legally considered, would do to change the Jody Arias case. As of yet, no Matt has come forward to confirm or deny Donovan Baring's account of events. Nevertheless, Baring underwent a lie detector test to validate the Matt theory. Were you truthful when you told National Enquirer that you became friends with Jody Arias in county jail? Yes. Were you truthful when you told National Enquirer that Jody Arias has a murder accomplice? Yes. She passed the test, adding yet another layer of mystery to the Jody Arias case. Donovan Baring was once Jody's close friend and confidant. Now Donovan wants to see Jody further condemned for the murder of Travis Alexander. However, there are still people out there who stand by Jody. Jody's a great person. I don't see the monster part that everybody else sees.
During Jody Arias' trial, complete strangers found themselves emotionally entangled with her case. The Jody Arias case really was among the first trials to take on a new life in the world of social media. Jody Arias herself had a Twitter page that she had people posting things for her. Jody's Twitter covered a wide range of topics. She was bashing Juan Martinez, the prosecutor, bashing the judge, Nancy Grace, bashing reporters for bad coverage of her. She even promoted artwork that she was selling on the internet. Jody's account was a fascinating window into her mind and people couldn't get enough. I think at one point she had over 35,000 followers. Among them was myself. But in the wake of her conviction, and after a falling out with Donovan, she no longer had regular access to her followers. Enter Arizona-based rapper Kareem Lefty Williams. Williams covered the trial on his blog. I had a celebrity gossip blog and I reached out to her, and then I started to go to trial. I was always talking to her via mail, and I would go visit her. After several months as pen pals, the two developed a friendship. Lefty was inspired to cut a hip-hop track, Jody Ann Arias, in the summer of 2015. Let it hit. Who is without sin? Cast the first stone. I want to talk to you about a girl that I know. I felt as though it would be very, very powerful for the both of us for me to do a song of what I felt about the trial. The media tried to make a monster. They just fueled the flame to make a prosper. Lefty sees Jody as an underdog, someone done wrong by the system. Above all, he sees her as a victim of domestic violence. From my experiences with Jody and, you know, talking to her and sitting with her, Jody's a great person. I don't see the monster part that everybody else sees. But then again, everybody else does, doesn't have the relationship with her that I have. Let's talk about remorse for a minute. Okay. I read it every time that she pin it. I'm not infatuated with, with Jody or anything like that. I look at her as my little sister, you know. We just talk about day-to-day -day stuff. Last time I went to go visit her, we did uh, take her pizza, took her ice cream. The relationship between Lefty and Jody gained more notoriety after one of their phone calls was leaked. Hello? Hey, hey. Hey, how are you? Oh, well, how are you? I'm doing all right. I think me and you are probably the most hated man and woman on, on Earth right now. It's all good. If this is what it's like to be hated, keep hating. <laughs> coming in my direction. I can't even respond to it all. People were especially outraged by Jody's upbeat recounting of her prison menu. We had chicken fajitas here tonight. Oh, wow. They were so good. Big old pile of, like, caramelized onions and some bell peppers. Like, all the work. On the weekends, they give us a hot dinner, but on the weekdays, we get, like, sandwiches. They were pissed because she was eating fajitas and that the prison served. Let's be for real. Like, how are you going to get mad at somebody because the prison served them chicken fajitas, and they happened to like We all make mistakes. The difference between us and her is that she made a mistake that she can't come back from. At Perryville Prison, Jody has occasional visitors, receives letters from fans, and is allowed out in the prison yard for an hour a day, provided she behaves. Recently, her visitation privileges were taken away after she verbally abused a guard. For a brief time, the world was Jody's stage. Although she continues to try to influence the outside world, whether through suing her defense lawyer or inspiring musical tributes, Jody's stage is now much smaller, her tiny cell, where she will likely remain for the rest of her natural life.